hands on mute. Uh, before giving you the floor, Paula, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Paula, and as well as uh, Christina Mitmasser, Angie Gago, Marco Bichnau, and Philip Lutz for having organized this uh, great event and also having invited Saskia Bonjour and Sarah Kunz at here at the NCCR on the move. So I guess, Paula, I will give you the floor to say a few words about this session, and afterwards we will let our, we will let this dialogue start. Thank you very much for this, Paula. Um, thank you very you much. Uh, thank you. So yes, yeah, um, uh, welcome from I guess the the organizing team as well. I'm, Extremely happy that this event is is um, going on now, and that we managed to have um, Saskia Mondo and Sarah Kunz as, as speakers. So um, this is because, um, as Robin said, we are concerned with the with the hierarchy interplay of the migration mobility nexus, and um, migration and mobility. Like in this in this understanding, we look at not only the neutral categories of migration and mobility, but how the the categories, the definitions, etc., um, reflect and reproduce inequalities of power, and also determine different opportunities to stay or to go. And um, why um, why I'm so extremely happy about the two speakers and the two perspectives is that I think this this concept of hierarchy is very multidimensional and not very straightforward. And so having two speakers from two different disciplines, but with very very different approaches and looking at very different phenomena, I think. Um, can really enrich our understanding. Um, so we have really kind of the two spectrums of the two, say the two poles of the hierarchy spectrum represented probably talking about the migrants with poor prospects and then the self-identified or non-self-identified expats kind of really on the two spectrums. And we have both a focus on policies and a focus more on individual experiences. And um, yeah, I think it will be an amazing challenge to bring that together, but hopefully very fruitful as well. And so I very much look forward to the two inputs. I think Saskia, you will start, right? So I hand over to you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. It's such a such a pleasure and privilege to be here and in such good company. Um, I'll start by sharing my screen. Um, yes. Does this look as it should? Yes, perfect. You can, yeah. Super, thank straight. you. Great. Um, so what I'm presenting today is actually research um, that I did with colleagues uh, a while ago, uh, but it fits so perfectly, like Paula just explained in the, in the topic of today. It's based on an empirical research of, uh, of parliamentary debates in the Netherlands, so the, the empirical case is quite specific, about a figure which in Dutch would be called the Kans Arme Migrant, and we translated that into English after much uh, uh, thinking and wrestling with the, with the translation as a migrant with four prospects. Um, now, what I'm going to argue today, based on that analysis, is first that in these discourses, both perceptions of national or cultural identity and class play a major role. So these notions of culture, national identity and class, they intersect, they overlap. They, they produce something together in very important ways. Uh, second, that this intersection of culture and class, it, it, is, it produces a racialization of migrants and their descendants. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a political discourse that is very exclusionary. It's a form of, I would argue, absolute exclusion, which is also why I think the concept of racialization is uh, is appropriate. And then third, that this racialization, this process of racialization, it justifies decreasing state responsibility for social justice. And maybe that doesn't make sense now, but I hope it will make sense uh, in a little while. Um, so this is an example of this discourse. This is uh, the rest of the analysis will be about parliamentary discourses, but this is a, 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 an opinion piece, what do you call it, an op-ed in a national um, um, newspaper by uh, Christian Democrats. Um, and it states the migrant with poor prospects 
should stay away. And here, the migrant with poor prospect is a marriage migrant. Um, so, what I would hope that you would take from from this first little bit is first, so the 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 exclusionary part, right? The the, the it, I can't make it much clearer that than this that the migrant with poor prospect is the undesirable uh, a migrant, and then that gender uh, norms and family norms play an important role. I hope I'll get to that in a bit as well. Um, I've worked on this with Jan Willem Dijvendak, who is a professor of sociology also at the University of Amsterdam. And not on this empirical uh, case, but on the on thinking through the role of class in the racialization and representation of migrants. I've done uh, work with Sebastian Chauvin and thinking and talking this through with him has uh, has contributed a lot to my own thinking. Um, and Sebastian is at the university uh, is at Lausanne, actually close to close to you. Um, OK, so getting into the parliamentary stuff. The, the moment where I traced the beginning of, a, of a intensive talk about the migrants with poor prospects is the mid 2000s. And, it, and that started with a, a moment in 2007 when the Freedom Party, so that's the PVV in Dutch, it's a radical right party led by Geert Wilders. It, it asked for a Muslim immigration stop. Um, and then the response of the conservative liberals, so that's the mainstream conservative right-wing party, um, their response was, our goal is not to stop Muslims, our goal is to stop the immigration of people with poor prospects. The way that you do it is not logical and not proper. So, so the notion of stopping migrants with poor prospects I hope you will hear quotation marks <laughs> every time I say migrant with poor prospects. Um, the notion of stopping migration migrants with poor prospects was presented as a reasonable and um, proper, decent alternative, right, to the notion of, of stopping uh, Muslims. That was the moment when this became a big thing in Dutch politics. Well, what I found really interesting was the response of the left to this, because the Social Democrats were in government at this point um, with the uh, conservative liberals. And at first they said, um, having good prospects is not a criterion in the Netherlands to have access to human rights, because you should remember that this was very much about family migrants and whether or not they would be allowed to move to the Netherlands. And so family migration, you know, the right to family life, that's a fundamental right. And so the uh, state secretary argued, well, that's not something that depends on whether or not you have prospects. And that this was a point where my in my uh, collaboration with uh, uh, Jan Willem Duivendak was super interesting because he's uh, written about the history of um, the welfare state in the Netherlands and beyond. And he recalled that this concept of Kans Adam, of having poor prospects, it's a it's a really crucial element in the social democratic ideals and values and practices of the of the 1960s, let's say, where there was a really strong notion that that those that um, instead of charity, right, instead of helping the poor, it should be about justice and about the state um, correcting injustice in society. So so those who uh, uh, had the, the malchance in life of being in situations that were about poor prospects, that had poor prospects because of uh, how the 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 in, unjust ways in which resources are divided in society, that the state should correct that and level the prospects of people, right? So that's where the concept comes from. So initially, social democrats responded in a pretty classic social democratic way, right? This having poor prospects is not about exclusion, it's about inclusion or repairing or emancipation. But that didn't last very long. Uh, because that same year, um, uh, the the Social Democrats made a switch and went towards uh, um, making the argument that dealing with integration problems requires putting limits on the arrival of mar migrants who are insufficiently equipped for a successful future in the Netherlands. So then their argumentation became much more about the um, overburdening of the welfare state and of other uh, public institutions uh, in the Netherlands by the wrong kind of immigrants. Um, now, who is the migrant with poor prospects? 
what, what, what characteristics are attached to that discursive figure. First, the migrant with poor prospect is assumed to be low educated. Um, so here I have a quote that says that what they want, what the VVDs or the conservative liberals want in future is highly educated people who will be successful, who speak the language, either English or Dutch is, is the same uh, to the VVD, have an education for which there is a true demand on the labor market and are capable of making money themselves. And all of that is not non-educated migrants with poor prospects, right? They won't get a chance anymore. Um, the migrant with poor prospects is also assumed to be non-Western. So this is where this cultural, national identity stuff comes in. Um, so here again, like you have to restrict the inflow of low prospect migrants from non-Western countries. If you want to solve issues of integration, there are 1.75 million non-Western immigrants in the Netherlands, and a large portion of these are migrants with limited prospects. This influx has disrupted Dutch society. We can talk about what non-Western means in the Dutch context uh, if you want uh, later. Um, the migrant with poor prospect is also assumed to be a welfare profiteer. So this is the Minister of Immigration, Yer Leers of the Christian Democrats, stating that we have to take measures to stop the entry of people with poor prospects, people who want to abuse our situation and only seek to profit from our community services. And along very similar lines, many migrants reject Dutch society. They only seem to be interested in our welfare provisions. Sorry. This is a masculine figure. This figure is assumed to be masculine, but there is also a feminized version of the migrant with poor prospect, which you saw already uh, pictured in the newspaper uh, article I showed to begin with, and that's the import bride. Um, so here is uh, um, the VVD. That was actually Margaret, who is now prime minister, saying we want to limit immigration with poor prospects to a minimum. Everyone who enters the Netherlands must contribute directly. No import rights is stuck at home. And then the Christian Democrats. Let's make sure that people can achieve a certain level of education in their country of origin. When they have achieved that level, then they can truly invest in a loving relationship and a bright future. The way we have handled this until now has led to a lot of domestic misery. So here the Christian Democrats are saying that if only we uh, um, set a minimum education level for immigration so that only highly educated people can move to the Netherlands, then we will have no more domestic abuse, right? So uh, a, a assumed relationship between domestic abuse and a level of education. So there's the welfare profiteer as the masculine version and the import right as the feminine version of the migrant with poor prospects. Um, what I find also important and painful is that the migrant with poor prospect is not only people who still want to come in to the Netherlands, it's also very much people who have been living in the Netherlands for decades. So here is a quote from the minister again, too many immigrants with too much distance from Dutch society and culture place a too heavy burden on our institutions and require too much flexibility from the population. Recent history of 30 to 40 years of immigration has taught us this much. So every time it's like, we have been admitting the wrong people for 40 years. We have to stop doing that. That's the argument that comes back time and again. So that's that's a way of saying every time again that a, a very significant part of the Dutch population is the wrong kind of people, right? Um, and then a final point that I want to make, that um, the mostly implicit counter figure of the migrant with poor prospects is the hardworking Dutch. So in 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 uh, in in Dutch that would be hard work in the Nederlander, and it's very important to note that this is not a working class person, this is a middle class person, in the Dutch imagination. And for instance, here's the Social Democrats saying we're talking about normal people, families with kids and dual earners. They keep our country going: teachers, administrative employee, police officers, construction workers, nurses, civil servants, and so forth. They are the backbone of the Netherlands. So I think what's happening here is that there is this racialized distinction between those who are the backbone of the country and who make who are normal <laughs> and have a, and make a, a decent living, right? Middle class people, and then the migrant with poor prospects. So um, the distinction between middle class people and and lower class people is is racialized, right? There's the white middle class people. 
and uh, migrantized and racialized uh, lower class people in this imagination of how society works. Which brings me back to that last part of my argument. Um, what happens, and I, I haven't been able to show that very much here, but it's explained better in the full article. Uh, what happens is that because the, the, the fact or the assumption of, the, of having poor prospects is turned into a characteristic of a certain group of people, which is inherently and essentially part of who they are. Right? It's not a propriety of society. It's not a result of how, you know, how particular social structures work or of social justice or injustice. It's a, it's a characteristic of certain people, right? And that's, that's, the, that's why I think racialization is the right term to use here. Certain people are represented as being inherently unfit, right? Inherently unfit for Dutch society, unable to to participate or to integrate, if you want to use that word, uh, in Dutch society. And then, in, and then in that sense, the solution for low prospects be becomes keeping these people out. Instead of having the kind of social democratic policies that used to be uh, uh, seen as the result for the problem of, uh, of poor prospects, right? So I think with this, with this racialization of, um, of inequalities in Dutch society comes also a very significant shift in in the perception of social justice and of the and of the role of the state in maintaining or repairing um, social justice. And that was it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I think I'll just hand over directly to to Zara for the second second keynote input. Can you hear me? Yeah, everything is in France, which is French, which is kind of making it harder for me. <laughs> um, thank you very much. I'm just trying to share my PowerPoint. Can you see the presentation? Yeah, perfect. Yes, right. yes, thank it's not in full screen yet, but yes, perfect. Uh, yes, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, excellent. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for inviting me and um, for inviting me with uh, Saskia Bonjour, whose work I really enjoy. So I'm really thrilled to be here with her. Um, I, you, you gave a quick introduction and because I only have 10 minutes, I'm not going to I'm not going to talk much more about myself. Um, but just to say that the research I'll be drawing on today is um, part of a monograph that I'm currently working on, which, which comes out of my PhD originally. And I will be focusing on the other end of the migratory spectrum, so to speak, on the category expatriate. So I think it, it fits really well. Um, with Saskia's presentation. And so um, the particular material I'll be drawing on today is uh, from one of the chapters in a book which looks at um, Nairobi in Kenya, the capital of Kenya, and draws on ethnographic research which I conducted in Nairobi in 2016. And so I uh, will be looking or talking about how the category expatriate is um, uh, produced in this particular diaspora space, um, and I'll be looking at organizational as well as individual kind of everyday discourses and practices. And by doing so, I'll be exploring how unequal mobilities, spaces, and bodies are produced in Nairobi, and kind of drawing out the, the wider relevance of that. Um, I'll be just presenting three snapshots um, if I get to them all. So first of all, I'll talk a little bit about um, not finding expatriates in Nairobi. Um, then I'll focus on intonations and the organizational uses of, of the category expatriate. And then third, I'll be looking at some everyday examples of making expatriate spaces and bodies. So not finding expats in a city of migrants, as I've called it. Um, I arrived in Nairobi in 2016 uh, with the aim of finding out what expatriate meant in Nairobi, who was labeled expatriate, who self-identified as expatriate, and what kind of belonging, community, and social relations the category engendered. Um, so I was interested in how the category expatriate or category like expatriate becomes uh, generative, but also generated in a particular urban context. And I was repeatedly told before coming and also while being there that Nairobi is the perfect place to study expats. However, actually finding the expatriate proved a lot more difficult and complex than suggested by such a statement. So imagine yourself arriving at an event like the one that um, the picture is from here and uh, discovering or finding out who is an expert here without describing the category to particular people. 
So I very quickly find out that while the uh, label expatriate is a prominently used term by migrants and non-migrants as well, it also is a contested term. And ultimately, it's a very elusive term. So not only is it hard to delineate who is an expat, but also there's not one meaning ascribed to that category. It's, it's inherently unstable. So the expatriate um, is exhibited a sort of misplaced concreteness when I tried to locate it in, in that particular social space. So first of all, it is not a category in immigration law. So the people that I met that self-identified as expat were on all sorts of residence permits or visas or you know, even some, some Kenyan citizens. Um, it also didn't really map on any particular employment status. So some people that self-identified as experts on these kind of posh international contracts, but other where other people were on rather meager kind of local contracts, as they are called. Some people were um, self-employed, homemaking spouses, and some people even worked, um, you know, while they were on tourist passes, technically rendering them irregular and deportable. So who is an expatriate in this context? And then closely related, the term expat is often used for highly skilled migrants. It is even used as a synonym for a highly skilled migrant. And arriving in Nairobi um, really showed the problems of, of doing so. So the people that I met that self-identified as expatriates or were labeled as such by others um, really had diverse professional backgrounds. They were more or less skilled, and then obviously the category skill itself is highly problematic. Um, and also the migrations didn't necessarily respond to any skills shortage in Kenya, as was particularly shown by the fierce competition between local and expat yoga teachers in Nairobi. So I think rather than studying or using the expat as a term for skilled migrants, we need to study how the category expatriate helps construct certain migrations as skilled, purposeful, and thus desirable within the logic of neoliberal global capitalism. And so this led me to really um, approaching the category as an elusive floating signifier, if you like. So as a powerful discursive and a performative category, a sociocultural category that took part in the organizing of social space and the fashioning of unequal subject positions and also social relations. And that inherently involved people that we might call migrants and people that we might not call migrants. Um, so approaching the expatriate as a, as a sociocultural category led me to looking for the sort of nodal spaces in the uh, in Nairobi's expatriate scenes. And I thereby uh, came across Intonations. Uh, for those of you that don't know Intonations, Intonations is a business that was founded in Germany originally uh, around 15 years ago, and it is marketing itself as the largest global expat network. Um, so it's a hybrid so social um, and professional platform that offers, uh, you know, information that is seen as relevant for expats, has local chapters or communities, as they call it, in different cities worldwide. Um, and there's a forum where members can organize their own events, so to speak. And at the time of research, I was told that Ni the Nairobi community, international community, was the largest in Africa. And... Um, it was thus a, a key institution, really, in Nairobi's expert scene. So whether one liked it or didn't like it or participated in it, the, uh, the company Internations had an important stake in constructing the category expert in Nairobi through its uh, discursive narration of the expert online, through the events that it organized, the geography of the events, and also through the membership that it assembled. And so Intonations uh, tapped into, you know, wider imaginations of who expats are and really actively produced uh, borderline glorifying imaginations of expats um, in order ultimately to sell its product. And one of my, you know, particular or favorite examples is this quote from their website. And I'm just going to read out the beginning of this. Um, Intonations here says that we believe there's something unique about expats a strength and spirit that drives us to move towards the unknown and embrace it. Like the explorers of the past and scientists of today, expats choose to go where things are unfamiliar, where they don't know what to expect. Expats are modern day pioneers. Nothing symbolizes this pioneering spirit like the albatross. So that is from the website. And so there's a lot going on here, which I won't be getting to all of it, but by association with the albatross, expats have become strong driven and restless. And these qualities are seen to elevate them literally and figuratively across the world and justify the implicit right to the world, right? So the very inclination of the expert to embrace the unknown justifies them doing so. Their desire, in effect, becomes their right. And in this way, the expatriate reproduces the normativity of the idealized white male and classed figure as uh, an individual that is unattached and unconstrained 
physically and mentally dominant, self-driven and capable. And it is not um, surprising that this narrative resurrects also the imperial trope of the pioneer explorer, so to speak. So the figure of the explorer um, came to symbolize and really rationalize European imperial expansion back in the day. And in praise, he really became a euphemism for um, occupation and exploitation, right? And in a very similar way, I would argue um, that international expatriate nowadays rationalizes deeply unequal post-colonial migration regimes. And it does so partly by um, turning privilege into achievement. And just to say that this kind of narrative of um, the expatriate as someone engaged in casual international itinerant mobility was echoed by many interlocutors in their own narrations of the expat life. And of course, such casual access to international mobility um, reveals a structurally privileged subject, right? So citizenship, of course, is central, you know, as, as people like Ayala Chacha have told us, is central to um, the way that mobility is uh, distributed as an unequal resource. But of course, individual wealth, uh, higher education and professional credentials, preferably from the West, all facilitate this kind of expat mobility. However, structural privilege remains unacknowledged in these sort of narratives. And instead, the expat's casual mobility becomes positioned as normative, as desirative, and ultimately as an achievement. So we here have a, a privilege and entitlement that is recoded as, as an achievement. And in doing so, Internations really is a uh, wreck picking, if you like, in the ruins of empire to create a fl very flattering identity that ultimately it uses to sell its, its business to, to members, right? So these are the kind of organizational discourses that, that shaped what an expat you know, was in Nairobi. But I would argue that uh, everyday interactions and the kind of socio-spatial production of categories is just as important in, in making expats. And so internations events and expat events more generally in Nairobi were occasions where people of many nationalities would mingle under the banner of a cosmopolitan, worldly and diverse expat community. And I was often told, and I could see myself, that the expatriate community, so to speak, in Nairobi had become a lot more diverse. So there were people from everywhere. And it wasn't just, you know, white expats, so to speak, Western diplomats or multinational, you know, <laughs> managers with their training spouses. However, the category expatriate stubbornly retained its um, normative whiteness and its association with class privilege. And I would argue that was not just because of the ongoing predominance of, of European and North Americans, you know, in multinational corporations and among those that have the, the means to seek an international lifestyle, but also in the everyday grounded production of the expat in Nairobi, racialized and classed hierarchies were reproduced. So the making of the expat also takes place through organizing racialized, classed and gendered bodies in space. And here I very much drew on Zara Ahmed's work on racism. And uh, she tells us that racism works as a way of orientating bodies in specific directions, thereby affecting how they take up space. So the places that were generally narrated as expat hangouts or where internations events would take place were often in high, you know, in upper, upper class, if you like, upscale neighborhoods and particular venues. And it was these venues that white bodies or bodies that were right as white entered easily. Um, so past dorm and insecurity, white people hardly had to justify their presence. They were assumed to be in place and they were made to feel in place. So in a way, you can say that the um, doors that the, the discourse of the expatriate narrates as opened, as open, were opened by whiteness, right? So expat spaces were spaces where white people could, to some extent, um, recover, if temporarily, a racially unmarked position where they became normative again, and that gave a certain respite. And in this sense, of course, the expatriate here um, kind of reflected, but also reproduced the historical tethering or tethering of, of whiteness, wealth and foreignness in places like Kenya. Um, uh, kind of a tethering that was formerly uh, officially produced by the colonial state, and of course, it's not so anymore. So on the other hand, speaking to people that were read as non-white in Kenya's particular racial hierarchies, um, they often told me that they had to perform extra work to, to be read as an expatriate or to claim the associated status. And one interlocutor put it really nicely in an interview. He said that I asked him about whiteness 
and whether it still carried privileges according to what he thought. And so he mentioned that, yes, of course, whiteness is a big thing. Like if you're just fairer skin, you don't even have to call yourself an expat. You're de facto an expat, right? So quite frequently, I'd hear accounts of having to qualify as an expat if you were read as non-white, of having to claim the category. And that worked through signaling wealth, signaling professional status, but also by being fluent in what was seen as Western habits, tastes, and discourses. So there was a more active performance going on that you know, white people did not have to engage in. And I don't know if I have time, but I, I'll, just, I'll just talk about it. Just to give you a brief example of the sort of kind of micro you know, moments that, that were really key to producing the expert in that space. Um, so the picture I've shown you earlier is through Bistro in Westlands, and there was a regular salsa night. And on one occasion, there was four of us there, and none of us were Kenyan. We sat at the bar, engaged in conversation. Wait, I'm just gonna... And then two young men start chatting to us. Although they stand right next to Fabian, one of our friends, they ignore him and talk across him to ask me where I'm from. Then they ask the other two women where they're from. Fabian jokingly comments that they did not ask him where he's from. One of the guy repl guys replies, oh, I assumed you were just from here. Just, Fabian repeats, noting the subtle conden condensation in a man's tone of voice and body language. Later, Fabian points out that the guy is ethnically Indian, had immediately mentioned that they were American. So I talked to Fabian about this event later on. And what we found was that these guys really attempted to draw us women into a shared community of Western foreigners, right? So they presumably mobilized the American citizenship immediately to disambiguate themselves from, from Kenyan Asians. Um, but at the same time, Fabian, who was black, um, was overlooked and excluded from the foreigners. And as he noted afterwards, his blackness positioned him as supposedly just local and thereby less interesting to talk about. Um, so these kind of racial politics of foreigners structure expatriate events more generally. However, they're hardly you know, moments of overt racism um, or kind of even conscious racism. And as such, they don't necessarily violate norms of cosmopolitan diversity. And I think this minor event also shows that although the expatriate is a global category, so to speak, it is always contextually grounded. And here it is enunciated within very particular racial hierarchies in Kenya. Okay, so just to, to draw out some of the kind of uh, findings, I think, first of all, I think that following migration categories is a really viable research strategy. And by following the expatriate, I, um, first of all, found the expatriate as a sociocultural category. So it is a collaborative and everyday effort beyond sort of political and legal discourses about the expatriate. And as such, it has really broader implications about how we imagine migration or who we imagine as the migrant, you know, or not a migrant, so to speak. And a second, class and racialization are really key here. But I think that we have to move beyond imagining all expats as white or thinking, you know, that only white people are called expats. Because the way that racism works nowadays, or you know, ideologies, ideologies of white supremacy reproduce themselves nowadays, often more insidious and indirect. So the expatriate is definitely involved in reproducing the normative whiteness of skill, professionalism, and status, and reproducing racialized and class hierarchies more generally. But it does not so by crudely, you know, only being claimed by white people. And so more generally, I think, and Saskia Stork has shown that, um, you know, very well, that migration categories have become more than just migration categories. They really are material and discursive spaces for the making of society more generally, or by the way, for the way that we imagine society. So social difference, social relation, more generally, are produced and reproduced on the grounds of, of migration. Yes, that's it. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't run over too much. All fine. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to both of you. I think these were two really fascinating talks that that can speak to each other. And I guess you uh, see, seeing you taking notes, let's get, I guess you have some ideas on that as well. Uh, to um, to kick off the discussion, I would I would start with um, maybe one or two questions from my side that really should kind of start off on, on dialoguing on the two talks. And after that, I will um, open up the floor to, to questions um, and comments from everyone who's here with us. Um, and yeah, I think the Zara, your talk really, um, you really managed to bring up um, some really nice pictures that I then 
tried to immediately kind of when you said you were looking for the expats, but it was actually hard to find them. I was thinking of Saskia going to to look for migrants with poor prospects and asking people, so why are you a migrant with a poor prospect and how they would react to that. Um, and I think kind of the, this really shows already how the contrasting the, the categories and the and the descriptions uh, can really reveal a lot. And um, I think a similar similar thing is true for the for the aspect of rationalization and how how you talked about whiteness or the how how your participants uh, talked about whiteness as a category that is um, that is very much privileged and aspired to by some uh, assumed by others in a category that you have to kind of claim if if it's not ascribed to you directly and so um on this aspect i was wondering I, I, don't, I know that Saskia, your research is very much focused on, on policy, uh, but of course it also has this, this performative character in a way. Now, who is the migrant with poor prospects and can migrants define themselves out of having poor prospects and how can they do so? And um, in, in the paper, you also have this, um, this contrast, not only with the Dutch uh, working class, but also the other migrants that I just barely mentioned they're not interested anymore. Yeah. So maybe you can talk a bit about uh, the performativity of these categories as well. Thanks. Yes, that's a great question. Actually, I was I was googling a bit yesterday to see um, to see if the if the term had uh, had travelled in ways that I that I hadn't uh, yet noticed. And one of the things that I mentioned is that indeed people who would be described as having a migration background, right? They would talk sometimes about, like my father was a, was a migrant with poor prospects and now look at me, you know, like uh, look at where I am now, like things like that, or, or sometimes also explicitly rejecting the concept. And then in particular, I think the, um, what's an interesting, um, moment in that sense now is that there is also so I, I guess there's the classic response which still happens a lot also in the Netherlands of but look at um so the chair of parliament used uh, uh, she was just replaced actually but the woman who was the chair of the parliament until two weeks ago um she was a a, a woman of Moroccan descent so we but look at her or look at that actor of Turkish descent who got you know like the most important prize or acting in the Netherlands, or look at that person who is the mayor of, you know, like, so So to look at, to point to successful migrants as a counter figure to the migrant with poor prospects. And then, but then there's also, uh, at least in my bubble, I don't know, I don't know how mainstream that is, that voice is, but there's also a, a counter voice saying like, we're Dutch people. We shouldn't have to, you know, like be, be any more exceptional or, particularly bright or successful or brave or whatever than other people to just, you know, like be. Um, so the, and, and that I think is a, is a, is a pretty explicit, it's a way of, I think, I think the figure of the migrant with poor prospects invites this counter response of no, we're, we're not poor prospect people. We're actually wonderful. And then, and then, and then, and then the even more fundamental response of like, don't force us to to even relate, you know, like to to, to these kinds of uh, of stereotypes in this way. Um, yeah, that was the. I don't. I don't know if I answered your question properly. <laughs> Did I go in the way that you wanted me to? The, the, the aim is not to go in the direction that I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, no, but I think I think that's super interesting and maybe to relate it back to, to Sarah, your work and the kind of the yeah, negotiation of categories of who has to be, who wants to be an expert. Um, I was wondering, did you also find the kind of counter claim? Because it's it's yeah. not beyond the imagination know that people think oh i don't want to be an expert i actually live here or i actually want all the to time know. all the time i mean that's one of the things that i think probably doesn't get talked about so much people really reject the category very much and it is interesting when um when you see that dance almost it is like a dance you know someone will be like oh you should talk to him he's an expert and then a person will be like i'm not an expert you know and so 
that's what made it so interesting and so difficult. And I found that to some extent, um, people that were rejecting the category, but often people that were quite aware of their privilege, but didn't really quite know how to deal with it. And so, you know, rejecting the category became became a way of saying, look, no, I'm integrated. I'm a good migrant. You know, I'm, I'm trying to be, you know, fit in. I'm trying to, to be a good person. But then often, and I, I write about that in a paper that's, you know, in a review, but often that kind of rejecting the category still reproduced a lot of the same discourses and narratives around what a migrant has to be, a migrant has to do, and what a good migrant did. And it didn't necessarily dismantle the privilege because, of course, categories and language only bring us so far, right? So you, you can call yourself what you want. That doesn't necessarily negate your privilege, at least for some people. And so I think what, what often um, the discussion about expats or not being an expat uh, neglects is the way that the, the language is, is rooted in very material and you know structural privileges that um, that you know rejecting category doesn't undo. And so I think people often struggled with that um, when they when they found when they saw the limits to their own individual action. And to some extent that is something that an individual can't change by rejecting the category, right? And so often when people were giving me examples of how integrated they are, and it's quite funny how how these very privileged migrants, some of them at least, that um, you know, were never necessarily com confronted with this discourse, at least from from politics. Um, really mobilized the discourse of integration as well. But then the examples of being integrated were, oh, look, I'm, I'm donating to charity. I have started an orphanage. I, I re I'm really, really kind to my employee. So, you know, these the power relations that were reproduced and the stereotypical imaginations of what is Kenya or who is a Kenyan were reproduced in this narrative of even rejecting the category. So you still had a, a Kenya that was traditional, that was poor, that needed help. Right, so rejecting rejecting the expat and positioning oneself as integrated didn't necessarily overcome, you know, the the very uh, you know stereotypical tropes that a lot of these discourses are invested in. Mm. Yeah, and um, I guess this kind of yeah this individualization of structural structural inequalities, I think that is something that that struck me in your talk as well, and that also relates back. Were very well known when you described the internation's um, self description or like the description of expats as, as as internalizing privilege as achievement. I think that is, I mean, that resonates kind of perfectly with the notion of um, of picturing the poor prospects as a as an individual characteristic rather than uh, rather than a societal failure, right? So I thought that was um, yeah. I think yeah. Just to, I think you you really. Putting it on the, I don't know, it's on the point, but that's really the point of a lot of these. That's how power works, right? By individualizing uh, failure, so to speak, if you want to call it failure, and um, and when it comes to privilege, you also individualize that. You can like, claim that as an achievement. Something that I didn't have time to talk about, but I really do want to talk about, so I'll say it now, is the fact that if you look at the the corporate structure of internations, it really does exemplify uh, the the expatriate. So if you think about, you know, social categories are reified social relations ultimately. So when you think about internations, which is a business founded by Germans in Germany, um, from where it directs its you know global business activity and where ultimately profits are repatriated to. Um, and that business, you know, caters to, to privileged migrants ostensibly and kind of reproduces the desirability of privilege. But at the same time, at least in Nairobi, a lot of the people, the members, because locals can become members as well, right? So a lot of the actual work of organizing events, of reaching out to people, of creating this online space was done by local volunteers. So you have this global business, which, you know, reproduces, you know, particular identities as desirable that aren't available to everyone. But at the same time, it really relies on unpaid and underpaid local labor, so to speak. So there's something really interesting going on in, in the social space that is created by that, by that category in this particular business context. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I respond to the to the individual collective thing? Because something so interesting happens there. Um, indeed, I, I mean, I, I love what the expats uh, uh, construction does in this sense. And and with the migrant with more prospects, I think it's a kind of it's a double move again. Because on the one hand, certainly this discourse is super connected to the whole neoliberal discourse on individual responsibility, right? So. If migrants make it to the Netherlands, then it should be their own responsibility to integrate and well very concretely to pay for civic integration courses for instance and you know like all of that is like individual responsibility um so so yes individual but on the other hand obviously it's a super collective category right i mean ra ra racial categories are 
by nature the opposite of individual, right? You you don't you can't see the individual for the massive uh, um, um, classification, uh, like very crude classification that racial classification is, right? So it's individual, yes, but then not at all, also. Yeah, great. I have many more thoughts and questions, but I think this is the time to open it up to um, to everyone in the chat, but also on, on YouTube. I think there Robin has, has to help me. Um, so yeah, if you have a question, um, raise your hand or, or write in the chat and then we can open up the, uh, the broader discussion. Um, questions? <laughs> If you're not not fast enough, then I will jump back in with my own questions. <laughs> Actually, can I ask a question of Saskia? Yeah, of course. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Um, I really enjoyed that. And I just I was wondering, and I think Paolo you actually brought it up earlier, in terms of, of talking to actual people that might be classified as such, um, what are the kind of responses? Or can you talk a little bit more about the sort of responses you get from, from people? And then also I, I I think, I mean, obviously there's also a lot of so-called experts in in the Netherlands who are sort of, you know explicitly not, you know, don't need to integrate. They they can speak English and all of these things. How are how are those people dealing with these sort of categories? So the first first part of the question, I can I can only answer the way I did before because I've never I've never uh, in, investigated that myself. So I, I only know from you know like reading newspapers and watching television and being on Twitter like <laughs> how uh, how people who might be categorized this way uh, respond. So that's only the people who have a voice, a public voice, right? I wouldn't know how how individuals with like less voice and less access um, um, respond to it or um, um, experience being categorized <laughs> this way, which with, France, with respect to, to the knowledge migrants, so definitely that's a major category and very clearly right from the from the parliamentary discourse, you can see that that is the desirable migrant, right? The highly educated migrant who is always imagined to speak English, and then <laughs> you know like whether or not they speak Dutch is not a is not a is not a relevant question to to anyone. Um, they're in this in, in parliamentary discourse, they are completely unproblematized. Like they're completely assumed, assumed also to share our values, whatever they are, and to not beat their wives, and you know, like all of that. So it's, it's, it's a, there's a very direct connection in that sense between class and assumed cultures mm -hmm. and values. And mm -hmm. um, there is not at the national level any um, problematization of highly educated mm -hmm. um, migration. Um, it's different in Amsterdam, so at the city level. Yeah. And then it's really about uh, housing and and you know like who is able to afford to live in Amsterdam and how are all these wealthy foreigners forcing us out of our own city? And so in Amsterdam, expat is a dirty word. And uh, and uh, the municipal it's very funny municipal government is trying to find other words other words <laughs> to refer because expat is not a good word so they're trying to use other words to refer to this category of people apparently they do need a category um, and I think uh, they call them internationals too which is what, uh, what yeah. internationals does as well yeah yeah that's very likely yeah so uh, I do recognize this strange expat expat is a bad word for a privileged group of people kind of. Uh, dynamics, but at the local level only. Yeah. All right, there are questions uh, pouring in now. So um, one was asked by, in the chat by Leah um, on the rationalization of migrants with poor prospects. So going back to the other end of the spectrum again, and whether it holds across all parties. And she says that in particular, the Greens generally take clearly liberal positions on immigration and diversity. We can respond to that. Yeah. Yeah, so the Greens were definitely the most critical of this discourse, but they were relatively silent in this particular debate. So they they weren't very. Maybe they've given up. <laughs> I don't know. That, but that's a that's a a good question to delve into again. There was there was a very interesting tension between the Social Democrats and the Greens. At some point where the Greens did stand up, which is when the Social Democrats um, 
they wanted, they proposed that uh, having um, uh, a certain level of education, so up until 20 years in school, right, up until, not, not 20 years in school, but until the age of 20 being in school, kind of, so um, 16 plus 4, that would be in the Netherlands, um, that that would be a requirement for um, family migrants. So you could only reunite with someone um, who had that level of education. And the argument was basically um, it's for their own good and also for the good of Dutch society because we just can't handle, you know, like too many people with poor prospects, right? And then it's not our responsibility to improve their prospects. It's the responsibility of their government of origin. So they should get an education where they come from. And then the Greens were really mobilizing this more traditional social democratic discourse, right? Of no, but education is for emancipation. Emancipation, uh, education is for, um, in Dutch you say, the having, you know, like for lifting people up, for, for it should be a motor, mo motor of social mobility, right? How can you use the emancipation, uh, education for exclusion? So it was really, you know, like the Greens were really calling the social democrats out for, you know, like we, we, used, we had this shared ideology, didn't we? And now what are you doing? And the uh, and the social democrats really stuck to the no responsibility, not our government responsibility, other government responsibility um, argument. But it was a uh, yeah, it was very fierce and I think very very telling also for where the social democrats in the Netherlands, at least at that point in time, uh, were uh, uh, seeing themselves positioned uh, in, in in respect to social justice, right, and to their own social democratic um, ideals. Mm. Yeah, it seems like the. Uh, sorry, Leah, go ahead. Thank you very much for, for this answer. I think it's very um, interesting actually to compare maybe the Social Democrats and the Greens because um, I think while they have quite similar positions in terms of questions regarding welfare and, and redistribution, um, so on the, on the uh, left right um, dimension, um, in many countries like Germany, not so much in Switzerland, actually they have quite different position when it comes to cultural issues like immigration. And so I think there could be an interesting tension. And I think your example um, kind of illustrates that. So thank you very much for clarifying. Maybe adding on to that, because one one thing that I was also fascinated by comparing the two presentations or researchers is, is the role of the state. Um, and I think um, Zaskia, in your presentation, it was quite clear how the how the state was perceived as very responsible for emancipation, and then this was kind of moved to the individual level, right? Or maybe maybe now back in uh, or not, depending on on the parties. And but the the discussion about expats in Amsterdam and and inequalities reproduced by expats could also be a question of, of policies and of the role of the state, no, not in integrating expats or in leveling down privilege or something. So I was just wondering if, if Sarah, you have encountered these kinds of discourses or whether you would like to see more of them. And of course, the question goes to Saskia as well. I mean, I can't speak about Amsterdam. I can speak to some extent mm -hmm. about the Kenyan context. And even there, my I didn't really do research on the contemporary political discourse on expats, but that definitely is a discourse. And, you know, I mean, Kenya has a growing middle class and there is increasing pushback towards the privileges that are assigned to foreigners, uh, often based solely on being foreign, right? So uh, from the time of independence, um, there was a, a fierce debate about, you know, the, the role of foreign workers and uh, especially highly skilled workers, people managing, people running things in the economy and to some extent the British before leaving set it up in such a way that the country would continue to be uh, dependent on, on foreign you know primarily British workers and actually sponsored us so one of the one of the things I'm looking at is the the, the um, development aid that was initially administered to a large extent was to to pay you know British civil servants for example a higher salary so that the the, the new independent state could rely so there, there was policy choices here and the, the independence politicians attacked that to some extent, but then also the way that Kenyan independence uh, worked out or the independent government pursued particular economic strategies that were highly dependent on, on multinational capital. So they really went down the capitalist kind of neoliberal route. So there is always the tension between, um, oh, you know, um, being tough on experts, but then also um, negotiating very favorable contracts for their employees for multinational corporations and the UN, for example, and Nairobi really is a hub of international organizations. So, 
And the government is using that in different ways. And I can't really, I haven't done in-depth research on this, but one of the things that came up while I was there is that they were cracking down on NGOs, which supposedly employ a lot of, you know, illegal workers, um, you know, interns from Germany or, you know, from elsewhere in Europe that weren't registered as, as workers, you know, and uh, where they could have hired someone local. So there was always that, that threat of cracking down on it. And it didn't really all happen that often or that visas wouldn't be extended, you know, work visas wouldn't be extended. It happened, but there was always a tension between attracting the firms, you know, attracting the organizations, um, but also catering to your growing middle class, which rightly so rejects some of the privileges that are afforded. Um, so governments really do have a funny, you know, situation, or there's a funny situation where they are positioning themselves differently, also depending on who they're speaking to. Okay, um, I'm coming back to another question in the chat by Laura. Um, that goes to Saskia on, on, on gender and religion. So the first is the, the gender distinction you pointed to and in the, the import bride, welfare profiteer, the two images, and whether that resonates with the picture of the welfare queen in the US. Um, do you see that in the Dutch debate? And um, the second part of the question is about intersections with religion. Can you expand a bit on the Protestant Calvinist discourse on hardworking individuals? So it's super, I've never thought about this comparison with the welfare queen category, but it's actually super interesting because you see, you see that, I think it is, it is really attached to the, to the black woman, um, as opposed to Muslim woman, also in the Dutch context. So the, the place where I think I can see a figure that res, res, um, resembles it is in debates about uh, delinquency among Antillian youth. And then it's the malfunction of their families that is being um, uh, blamed basically on their mothers, on their single mothers, right? So, so that's the one place, but I don't think it's related to welfare then, but it is, but it is to a particular category of the single mom, right? Which is also very crucial to the welfare. So it's really, it's really the descendants of slaves and their family structures, right? That are, that are um, uh, being, uh, um, um, targeted by that category, also in the Netherlands. Um, and I think the the Muslim, so it's the Muslim woman, right? The import bride is a Muslim woman in the Dutch imagination. Um, and she's not, she's, she is too passive in that imagination to, to be a profiteer, right? She is just an absolute victim with no agency whatsoever. She is locked up. If she has some agency, it's in passing on traditional va values to her children so that they also will beat and lock up their wives. I'm, I'm, I'm cutting, cutting a few corners, but, but not even that many, right? I mean, it, it's, a, it's a pretty flat stereotype, really. Um, so no, it's, it's, a, it's, a different, it's a different racialization of the, of the feminine, um, um, of, uh, I was going to say migrant, but obviously the welfare queen is not a migrant. Um, yeah, and this question about the Protestant, the possibly Protestant background of this working, hardworking Dutch, I would have to do more comparative research than I've done. I don't know whether, I mean, other people in the room, um, it was actually really interesting to me. Like it took me going to Germany and talking about this figure of the hardworking Dutch. And then people were asking me questions that confused me. And, and, and it took us a while to figure out while we weren't understanding each other when when only then it dawned on me that for the Germans in the room, it was obvious that a hardworking German person would be a, a working class person, right? Whereas the working class, like the working class is not a category that exists in the Netherlands. Like, like it's <laughs> Dutch people are all middle class or they aspire to be, or they're supposed to be. And that's actually something that I, um, that, that really I learned from Sébastien Chauvin. So the other co-author, how super classed, um, these imaginations are right. Like also the day day when they're saying so the conservative liberals when they're saying that they only want highly educated people, right? Because those are the only people who can succeed in the Netherlands. I mean, what does that say about their imagination of of, of the Dutch population and and who is a good citizen? And it's it's very Bridget Anderson in that sense also, right? I mean, who are good citizens and who are failed citizens and who are somewhere there in between? So it's really an imagination of the 
of the Dutch or of the good Dutch or of the Dutch who matter as a, as a pretty high, I mean, upper middle class uh, category of, of people. Um, Laura, do you want to come in maybe on the question? Is it a question of religion or if someone has a... Um... No, I think Saskia answered the questions very well. Thank you. <laughs> Um, but I think one of the of the questions on YouTube actually resonates very well with that is uh, in, because the question is by Marie Walter and says, I'd love to hear more about how these two categories relate to how membership in the Dutch and Kenyan societies are constructed. So the, I guess the question relates to society as a whole rather than um, just the question of migrants or expats. Can I add my question to that to Sarah? Because I was so intrigued when you said that when people don't want to be an expat, their counter response is, I am integrated. So apparently there's something about the expat. Is that this notion of the rootless cosmopolitan who can go anywhere, who has no ties and therefore no responsibility? Is that is that it? Is that what they're such an interesting? Yeah, I think so. The way I approached it in research, and I'm, I'm thinking about changing now, is that I, I kind of map different readings of the expat. And one reading was this itinerant, you know, casual, um, you know, globally mobile person. Another one, which was more from the perspective of Kenyan society, was the unintegrated privileged foreigner. A third one might have just been a white person. Right? So there was a lot of people who were like, oh, experts are just white. And obviously there's some, some, you know, some reason to that. <laughs> and then a fourth one was um, the highly skilled, you know, the desirable, valuable worker. So there were different map, uh, different readings that obviously related to each other, but they didn't map onto each other. So definitely, people were arguing against being unintegrated. Um, you know that that and but again, that discourse wasn't necessarily enforced upon them by the state. It was amongst migrants. You know, really amongst people. And when they were trying to prove the integration, it was usually to other migrants. You know, not towards maybe their Kenyan colleagues. Um, but in terms of the membership in in Kenyan society, I mean, there's there's so many dimensions to this. I think that first of all, there's there's a majority minority of, of white Kenyans, right, that are kind of descendants of settlers or administrators that that live there and are Kenyan citizens to some extent, um, or some of them, but um, that imagine themselves as Kenyan and they are really really annoyed by being labeled expats. Um, and to some extent, in in the that that's very simplified, but in the imagination of of white Kenyans and and white migrants, whiteness is really important in Kenya. But actually, a lot of divisions in Kenyan society have nothing to do with whiteness. You know, I mean, the white minority is really marginal. So there's there's huge, you know, divisions within Kenyan society based on on community, on you know, on language, on on religion to some extent. And a lot of these, um, there's stateless populations that you know have been stateless for generations. There's people that, um, you know, there's huge populations of refugees, and then the Somali Kenyans who are targeted as you know refugees when really they're kind. So there's a lot of divisions, and you know. Uh, issues coming up in in society that really have nothing to do with these privileged um, with these privileged migrants. But I think that also there's there's other terminology um, which I get a little bit more at in the in the um, in the chapter. But Muzungu, for example, is a term that's often used across East Africa um, for um, for white people, but not only for white people. But so often, um, you know, when you walk down the street, you'll be you'll be like called Muzungu by by a child, um, for example, and that's often considered as rude. Because people don't like being, you know, pointed out. And Mike Feshta has done amazing work of the, on that and in, in the different context. But um, yes, so to some extent, the expatriate does position whiteness outside the Kenyan nation, um, which itself uh, racializes the nation and the national imagination, which um, which is problematic to some extent and uh, has, of, of course, genealogies linking back to the colonial state and to the way that decolonization worked. Um, but Again, there is there's so many divisions going on that this video is just a small, a small slice of the discourse, if you like. Um, all right, there's a, a another question which I guess very much resonates to that as well. That is of of dominant speaker. So I think it's to both of you. Whether your empirical work exposed dominant speakers in this in these stigmatizing discourses and specific dynamics of interaction between legal and discursive categories, I guess Saskia toward analyzing parliaments necessarily means um, looking at certain kinds of speakers, but there's probably a still yeah. 
Yes. Um, but, but I think for this particular concept, for the, the Kans Arme Migrant, it's actually, I think it's, uh, it, it, it did uh, originate in politics, so in parliamentary and political discourses, and then to some extent was also adopted in other uh, kind of discourses. Um, and it's um, so it's a uh, and that's because it it was originally uh, like a social democratic concept, right? It had its its roots there in in policy discourses or in and in political discourses about the role of the state and the welfare state. Um, and yeah, and it's very clearly the right that brought it in, sort of conservative mainstream parties that introduced it with this in this context. And then uh, left-wing parties, to an extent, adopted it. Mostly the social democrats, not the greens. Um, yeah, and this question about how how legal le how this relates to legal categories is super interesting. I never I um, never thought of it um, this directly. So very clearly, these discourses are aimed to justify restrictive. Migration policies, right? That's that's what that's the function of these of these discourses, and 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 here it's very specifically about having very strict civic integration uh, rules, so difficult exams and exams for entry and exams for having uh, permanent residence, um, and they are about stopping family migrants and uh, refugees. So this is this is this is really the category that is being targeted here, right? It's uh, um, 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 so it's it overlaps with this in 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 French there was this immigration subi uh, category, so the immigration that is not chosen that happens to European governments. That was Nicolas Sarkozy's discourse. Um, so it is a it is a way of talking about family migrants and refugees that completely turns the conversation around, right? Because then it's no longer about humanitarian obligations or about, about families or about, but it's about, it's, uh, it's centered Dutch society and what uh, people think that society needs or can handle, right? Because for the social democratic uh, discourse, it's really about what we can handle the, the, um, yeah, there's this spankracht is the word they use in Dutch. It's the word that says like how much, how how far far you can stretch something be before it breaks or before it uh, tears. Um, so I would say that's that's the categories that they the legal categories that they relate to. Can I just follow up on that and quickly ask? So I, I really enjoyed um, in your paper as well as the talk the way that you traced the transformation of that category from a category that was. Not racialized or the way I understand it, but but classed really, right? It was a it was a category, it was a class category that was then kind of recycled and reinterpreted and reused, and then a very racialized became a very racialized category in a racializing category, really. But it, what is interesting is also that how that happened at really the end of empire to some extent, right? So you had a situation where where the Dutch Empire was breaking apart and a different sort of migration started happening. If you like, or maybe I'm maybe I'm thinking too much about the British context, but um, where where sort of the racialized politics to some extent came home. If that if if you can talk about that, is there something like that going on? Do you think? What a great question. So the 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 immediate aftermath of decolonization and and the and colonial post colonial migration in the strictest sense strictest sense of the word was in the 1940s and 50s and 60s from Indonesia and the 1970s and 80s from Suriname, right? And the, and the categories of people that are being uh, racialized here are not primarily people from former colonies, uh, but people from Turkey and Morocco who are descendants um, often from the people who came as guest workers. Um, guest workers with a quotation mark, labor migrants in the 1970s, 60s. Um, so I would not connect it to the end of empire as a moment, because that was more in the 1970s and other stuff was going on then. 
uh, also in the 1940s and 50s. Um, but it might be very interesting, but this is just something that I haven't uh, done yet to look at how notions of social justice and welfare uh, were shaped in Dutch colonies and how they were racialized and how that would compare to, uh, to these kind of contemporary discourses. I mean, that, that I haven't done that, but that, that could be super interesting. Yeah. New new areas of research coming up. Um, Petra asked a question in the chat um, that is to, I, I guess, to both of you as well. Um, it's how much Sarah's description of intonations concerning the desire to do something becomes their right to do it. But that was also a very interesting aspect and how it could be related to the, to the political discourse in the Netherlands. What do politicians base their seemingly clear moral right to exclude um, the migrants with poor prospects on. And I think it's this very self-evident, seemingly self-evident notion of national sovereignty and of, um, so for the conservative liberals, just being allowed to select those who are most, who will contribute most. Right, and also the notion of protecting, so for the social, both for the social democrats and for conservative liberals, the notion of protecting an obligation on the part of the Dutch state to protect Dutch society from immigration, which is, it's called disruptive, right? I'm going to say the Dutch word again, sorry, I do this all the time, ontvrichten. So that's, that's really like that, it's taking something at the very root and then and they were, they were like, politicians were talking about how disrupted Dutch society was. And all the time I was looking like, well, supermarkets seem pretty well stuck to me. All the trains and buses are, you know, like running in time. I was, I was really struggling to see the disruption. But it's a very strong word, right? So it's, it's this notion of, uh, of immigration of the wrong kind as disruptive and the obligation of the state to protect Dutch society from that. And then for the social democrats, it's really about like we have we have our public institutions and there's only so much that they can do, you know, like our teachers and our hospitals and our welfare state and, you know, like and our uh, uh, social workers and all these people. There's only so much that they can do. And so we shouldn't overburden them um, with, again, the wrong kind of immigration. So those discourses were the legitimizing ones. And I think what is fascinating in the first part of Petra's question is also how something that is really required of, of uh, migrants in the Netherlands, you know, to integrate and, and be good citizens, if, if, they, if they are let in in the first place, I guess, is something that is really a right and kind of something that even enhances the privilege of white expats, you know, who, who become even more desire, desirable because they also integrate and they also run a charity or something. Yeah, um, Adrian Favel has a quite long comment. I thought maybe if you if you want to just come in uh, and talk instead of can you hear me? Yeah, great. Yeah, hi there. Um, yeah, I just wanted to challenge both speakers a bit to try and problematize a bit the, you know, in some sense the unsurprising findings that they they present. I mean, in terms of you know, they're not things that we'd we'd not expect in a way from the situation of. In terms of excluding immigrants um, in the one case, or um, uh, you know, finding evidence of ongoing racial colonial formations in the in the um, African case. Um, so I mean, I, these were these were these were two separate sorts of points. But I'm just sort of trying to turn turn things around analytically, so that so that we're kind of really working on on some of the paradoxes of of um, you know, where the lines get drawn in a sense. So for me, it's more interesting to think about wanted immigrants rather than unwanted immigrants. Because that very narrow categorization of wanted immigrants is, is how integration is defined or, or rather integration defines who an immigrant is. And there are a lot of people in our societies who are mobile, but the state, the receiving state or society can't call an immigrant because they, because precisely because they are international mobile people or whatever that are not in that category. And then there are others that it can categorize as unwanted a, a, according to all of the criteria that you identified, um, Saskia. And then the point the point with um, 
with Sarah was was a fairly obvious one, really, just to sort of. I mean, it's it's very heavily determined by the African setting you're finding. So, you know, if if you were to compare this to all the studies of expats in in East Asia, you know, what what would be revealed in a sense? Because um, you know, the studies in East Asia always focus on the, the ambiguities of the power dynamics in the post colonial context. It's it's not just about the white colonial power, but it's also about the white white power in relation to, um, you know, rising Asian societies, et cetera, where people are um, also to some extent marginalized or unable to to kind of occupy the, the, the powerful positions all the time. Um, and, and I think the, you know, I, I, I'd go back also, of course, to the, you know, I've done work on 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 European free movement in Amsterdam. The the question of expats in Amsterdam is 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 interesting precisely when we take the obvious racial question out of the out of the equation, but then we still find that a certain sort of racialization takes place even with the most unlikely people, such as white Germans in in a Dutch society. Um, or, or you know, the question is there: can we call that racialization or not? I don't know. Um, that's not clear to me either. Um, so th those are just a few thoughts. Thanks. I can just comment something quickly. Um, although there was, there was, yeah, quite a few thoughts, as you say, Adrian. Um, I think, yes, first of all, of course, I mean, the findings are heavily reliant on the African context, because that's the one I, or not even the African context, I'd say. I'd, I'd say we have to be a bit more nuanced here, maybe the East African or particular Kenyan context, which is very different to some extent to what happened in South Africa or in particular Western African context or Northern African context. Um, and I think to some extent, I wouldn't even, Post it as a problem. I think maybe you should do some more work <laughs> in different African contexts and speak back, speak back to migration studies, as as we know it, um, because obviously these are these are contexts that haven't been studied um, maybe as much or from where we don't know as much. And in relation to the um, East Asian studies you mentioned, yes, I mean there's been a lot more research, and to some extent the dynamics are, are very different in in particular contexts. And of course there's Dubai and Katie Walsh's work in Dubai, which is a very different context again to to you know Carolyn Knoll's work in Hong Kong. But I think that I think actually the this picture is just as as complex or as difficult in Kenya. It's not just you know, and I hope I didn't I didn't portray that. It's not just the white dominance that that keeps being reproduced. That's a lot more complex than that. And of course, it's it's easier to get at that in the paper than in a ten minute presentation. But um, just focusing on the category of white here, um, thinking about the Kenyan context or the Nairobi context, people passed as white or were read as white that maybe weren't read as white as Europe. And that came up, for example, in talking to an Albanian respondent or Turkish. These people were suddenly white in, in the Kenyan context or Nairobi context or a Romanian respondent who was really, really annoyed that she was read as white because she's like, I lived in the UK before. I was not white there. I am not white. I am not part of that history. But then she was continuously you know, identified and put in that category of the white privileged foreigner. So there, there was a lot going on with the shifting boundaries of whiteness that really are contextual. And I think in the East Asian context, whiteness is a very different, you know, uh, you know, shape, if you like. Um, I think these these differences are important. So whiteness isn't just one, you know, one global complex, if you like, and it, it gets reproduced in different ways. And it also gets challenged. I mean, in the Kenyan context, it gets challenged by 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 Kenyans a lot, right? So the ongoing um, land ownership of of the white minority in Kenya gets challenged all the time on social media and political discourse, for example. Um, and people that do want to belong are racialized as other and excluded from the nation in, in, in many ways, right? So I don't know if I'm answering your question, to be honest, but um, I think that A, that yes, the situation is more complex than just white dominance being reproduced. And I think we have to understand a bit more, but I think B, also I'd push back a little bit by saying that these different contexts is just as complex as East Asian context, even when we think about uh, geopolitical relations. Thanks, Sarah. Can I can I jump in? Yeah. Um, um, so I think the the category of wanted immigrants in this particular discourse, so in the national political discourse in the Netherlands, it's um, the assumption is not that the state can integrate them, or or whether or not they need to control them. It's it's the assumption that they are already integrated. They don't like the the whole category of integration does not apply to highly educated 
migrants who are who are imagined white along exactly the, the lines of whiteness that Sarah just described, right? So it's not necessarily attached only to whiteness or it's it's more easily available to white people, but it's not exclusively available to white people. The whiteness, it's, it's exactly the same um, racialization, I'd say, that, that Sarah, I think, very carefully um, delineated. Um, and so, so that's really, they are already like us, right? That's the assumption. There's integration, it's just not a category. And then, and then with regard to, so, so it's also not seen as a problem if they are free floaters from the national, national political discourse, right? Because they are, they are wanted <laughs> um, and they are like us. So their presence does not disrupt anything in this imagination. But this is a very heavily classed um, discourse in the sense that um, um, there is, there are forms of problematization of intra-EU migration when it is a uh, lower class or less skilled or manual skills. Because um, actually it's, it's, it's quite complicated because it's also not problematized when it's like young people from Southern Europe who come to work in Amsterdam bars and hotels and stuff. But it is problematized when it is construction workers or uh, people who come to work on farms. And then it's also um, because of uh, forms of exploitation that are more or less um, taken into or uh, yeah, made visible in the in public debate. So um, yeah, it's, 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 it's very interesting, I find, to see to whom the, this question of integration is seen to apply in the first place. And it's literally put that way, right? Like, they don't need to integrate. Yeah. Can I just follow up on this again to, to Adrian's comment that most immigrants aren't highly skilled? And I think Saskia has, has showed us to some extent. You're right, of course. I mean, immigrants are constructed as not skilled. And I think we have to also look more carefully maybe at, at how skilled is constructed. I, I'm not an expert on this, but I do know that. And, you know, how is skill measured by states? It's measured by income often and by maybe, you know, professional credentials or qualifications. In some contexts, I believe it is only measured by income. So we have to think about uh, what, how skill gets measured, how skill gets constructed and how skill gets, you know, associated with certain bodies imaginatively. A, a lot of these experts, uh, a lot of immigrants, if you want to call them that in, in Nairobi, aren't skilled as well, right? But they still get positioned as skilled and treated as skilled. So I think it's it's not, it's really interesting. I think it's an important point that you're raising. And in terms of, of integration, I think you are right. And highly skilled people are imagined as being integrated globally into the global economy and the global, you know, neoliberal economy. But the national still matters and the local still matters and still people, I mean, at the local level will push back against that. I mean, and I think Saskia made that really clear for, for the city context, right? I mean, and to some extent, people's own desire. I mean, to some extent, if you look at how the discourse of integration has been globally circulated, it's it's quite interesting. Interesting. I mean, you've shown yourself how, how integration rests on all of these funny assumptions and assumptions about society, but how people emotively respond to it and incorporate in their own narration of who they are and who they want to be. Yeah, quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Maybe as we're slowly coming towards the end, um, there is um, a question by, by Janine Dernan in the chat on the welfare state. Um, and uh, wasn't the welfare state since the beginning about us and about exclusionary processes? So maybe this is more to to Saskia, at least uh, at the face of it. And that's actually something I was also wondering when, when reading the paper, is this progressive discourse now about poor prospects and how to um, how to improve them as a state in the 60s was kind of happening at the same time as the guest worker area was probably at its heydays. No? So that was also something I find interesting to get more into. Yeah. So, um, so definitely, and um, the the in the Netherlands, it started with I th I think it was it is a relatively common trajectory in the in the large lines of it in the sense that there was first a welfare state that was very much about um, where where being poor was seen also as being morally deficient, and so and so that's from the 19th century onwards, right? And in the first half of the 20th century, so where where uh, social policies were about um, charity and elevating elevating the poor, right? To the also morally uh, civilizing the poor, really. 
and and then the 1960s indeed bring this shift towards thinking in terms of social justice and of um and of equal chances and opportunities and of the role of the state in uh correcting those opportunities and indeed that is happening at the same time more or less a little bit before um the the discovery in the netherlands of of immigration right obviously immigration happened before but this was a moment of intense immigration and of lots of politicization also of immigration and uh, what the the dutch originally did then was have uh, minorities policies and these were uh, definitely based on the assumption that there was um, a relationship a connection between the cultural characteristics of minorities and their social position and to an extent i would say that their that their ethnicity was also seen as part of the problem right of part of their of the of the of what was of the cause of their um um backward position in dutch society right i don't know if i'm using the right words um but the state at that point still very clearly had a job in the perception like in the political perception like it was that the the connection between culture and class at that point did not result in the conclusion that there was nothing for the state to do but to exclude these people there was a massive effort in the 1970s and especially the 1980s uh, to emancipate minorities like lots of money were pumped in and organizations and and so that's i think the shift so the connection between ethnicity assumed ethnicity and class position has a history in that sense in the netherlands at least back to the 1960s um but this moment where it results rather in the in the in the conclusion that we should just keep them out rather than there's a job for the state to do that's a new thing i think Great. Um, thanks very much. Um, I hope I haven't overlooked any, any pressing questions uh, in the chat. But anyways, um, I think that was fascinating. It was really like time time flew by and there were so many issues raised. Um, and thank you for being so flexible with all the different questions. Um, but I think I, I and I hope you you agree with me that um, that we have seen that it's it is useful to have so so different topics kind of combined in one lecture. And um, I thought it was really fascinating to follow. And I, I have also thought that there were many commonalities revealed in, in categories and how they work, but also like you could really see how contrasting expats and migrants with poor prospects can, some, can point at some of the blind spots, some of the contradictions and might be a useful tool of, of pointing out contradictions when they are when they're just just assumed or just not not mentioned in public discourse. So um, with that, I, I would like to thank you very much again for accepting our invitation and for the fascinating talks. Um, thank you to everyone who asked questions um, in, in the chat and um, to Vauba, of course, for organizing all of this. Um, yeah, and I don't know, Vauba, if you want to have the last word. No, just to say uh, thank you to all and uh, for this fascinating discussion. The, we had other questions actually in the chat I can see and also on YouTube. I'm really sorry if I can if I can take them all because uh, now we are running out of time. But uh, yeah, thank you again. And uh, I would like to invite you to the to the la the fourth and last um, public lecture of our series, which will take place on the 27th of May with a lecture by Nicolas de Genova, um, which will be um, entitled Migration and the Antinomies of Mobility. Uh, so it's on the 7th, 27th of May at 6.15. So here is the appointment and thank you again to all. Thank you to Saskia and Sarah and Paula for the organization. Okay. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. And then see you tomorrow for in half yeah. an hour. Robin, are we in the same room or is it a different link? Um.